as well. What we want to talk about is what is the state of open source uh, supply chain security? Why should we care about it? Uh, what are some of the initiatives and tactics and strategies in this space? Uh, what should OSPOs do about this? And also, uh, what you, as um, an open source you know, activist participant, should do about this? So with that in mind, um, I'm going to turn to my panel and ask each of them to introduce themselves and, and how they got into open source security and what their interest is in open source security. I'm going to start to my right with Rao. I, that's the trick. I look at I look at Andrew and then I turn to Rao. <laughs> Cool. Uh, my name is Rao Lakakula. I'm a senior security engineering director in JP Morgan Chase. So op you asked about security, but I'm going to start with open source yes. and then move into security because I started in open source uh, close to 20, 22, 23 years back. Uh, when I start first working, I started in startups. Um, and then basically we looked at open source as a free <laughs> way to kind of minimize the cost for the open source. But eventually I got hooked into it because then the stuff I don't, uh, I need more features or the stuff I need more enhancements rather than going through a big vendor and wait for a year, it's actually easier to just just either contribute or work with the maintainer. So that's how I got into it. It helped with the startup to save money too. Uh, then eventually I got into security uh, 15 years back. So obviously it's a good, um, juncture to like apply security into the open source and that's why I got into open source security. And I involved with uh, open source security coalition. We was back in 2019 when uh, GitHub, Microsoft, uh, IBM, few of the guys thought we need to start looking into open source security more holistically. And we started that group and that actually group eventually turned into open source security foundation and giant Linux Foundation. So I'm from the beginning of the Open Source Security Foundation, I'm the founding board member, and I'm still one of the board members. So to circulate that, I think it's more of a start as open source than security, and then I had opportunity to combine those two. Mm -hmm. Jeff. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Boric, and I work for IBM, and I've been in and around open source for over a decade, and. <clears throat> I see some familiar faces out in the audience. Um, one of the things I became responsible for goes back about seven or eight years ago because IBM has a very rigorous um, uh, IP risk management function that I was asked to take responsibility for. And as I'm sure many of you know, when you're consuming open source, there's two risks, the primary risks, there's others, but the primary risks are the IP or legal risk and then what is the code quality and or security of that package, that free software that you would like to consume? And, you know, new into that role, I started to realize, well, wait a minute. Um, we're doing this centrally from a legal perspective, but who's doing the centralized security quality review? And the answer I got back initially was kind of crickets, which is kind of concerning. But then I realized, well, wait a minute. IBM had distributed that responsibility out to the business units because IBM's a big matrix company. IBM's got over 1,800 uh, products and virtually all of them have some level of open source under the covers. But it did start sleepless nights. Yes. <laughs> because um, when you distribute a, an important function like that across a large matrix organization, you can get distributed results. And so I started having discussions with colleagues uh, outside of IBM as well as inside of IBM. And that led to my getting involved with the um, early version of the OpenSSF back just when the pandemic was hitting about three years ago and no one was uh, willing to write a check. It still got off the ground initially because, you know, not just IBM, but uh, Wipro, JPM, Morgan Chase, uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, and many other tech companies were also starting to have the same realization. And it's a problem th that's 
technical debt within the ecosystem. And it's too big for any one organization or company to solve. So that's what got me interested. Uh, yeah, exactly. A lot of our stories are very similar. Um, Andrew, how, how did you get involved in open source security? Well, let's see. <clears throat> um, Andrew Aiken, I'm uh, global head of open source for Wipro. And let's see, I've been in open source about 23 years. And in, in security, just about the last three years. And I think it was actually uh, one of our account managers at one of our banking clients, not JPMC, who, who came up and said, our client wants us to develop uh, an open source cybersecurity strategy. You're the open source guy. Your team needs to do it. I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> really, I, I did not know much about it at all. Uh, obviously, I understand open source pretty well, but not cybersecurity. And so then my team and I spent a lot of time. We got, inv we got involved. We did a lot of research. We got engaged in OpenSSF, and here we are today. And, and just to tell my story, um, I'm Nithya Ruff, and I uh, had the open source program office for Amazon. And my story is, you know, just like you, I've been involved in open source for uh, 20 plus years. And uh, it was actually at Comcast and uh, I was running the OSPO at Comcast. And we wanted to use the same software composition analysis tools. And we discovered that the security team was already using white source or other tools uh, to do security, uh, you know, analysis. And so we started uh, you know, partnering with them. Then we realized that uh, we had an opportunity to uh, pull our security team into open source initiatives like OpenSSF. And so we started talking to them about becoming members of OpenSSF and really worrying about upstream security and not just, you know, when it comes through the door and then screening for it and then uh, thinking about fixing it or uh, you know, even looking at vulnerability databases and things like that. That was my first kind of uh, introduction that our security team really needed a guide from the open source program office side, and we needed to collaborate together on tools, on approaches, on, you know, membership, supporting upstream, et cetera. So, so that kind of uh, really uh, impressed upon me. Um, just, I, I know we've touched upon this uh, briefly in our introductions, but why should we all care about open source security? What is the state of open source security today? Is it, why? I mean, is it because we are consuming it more? Is it because it's produced all over the world and we need to understand the state of it? Um, Rao, do you want to take a stab yeah, at it? Definitely. I think it's actually all of them. <laughs> I think more software being produced in general and more open source being consumed in all the software we produce. Something like 80, 90 percent. Yeah. yeah, definitely more than 80 percent and somewhere around 90. Um, and also we're seeing it's not just the vulnerabilities in the open source packages we consume. We're seeing new trends in the industry that there are packages which are, to start with, being malicious. The intent is to do bad. We're seeing more packages that. And we're also seeing the attacks on the supply chain of those packages. So the last three years actually been really changed the dynamic that we have to worry about this a lot seriously now. Earlier it was like yeah, there was a known vulnerability, there's a patch, so it's more about, it was a more a vulnerability management problem, but it's no longer a vulnerability management problem. It become a, a fundamental software security problem. I think that's the reason we need to understand. And one other thing is like, I mean, most of you guys from a big um, enterprises, in enterprises, we, we bring in a lot of packages. It's not handful. You're talking about hundreds and thousands of packages, which has hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dependencies. It's a transitive dependency that is very critical here because now your supply chain is going all the way back to their dependency, their dependency, their dependency. It's not just the package you consume. So that's why I think uh, it, it's a lot serious problem uh, than it looks from the surface. So you're pulling in a lot more than you think you are. 
Jeff, what, what would you think? Uh, well, we it's care? a serious topic, so I just want to quickly just get a uh, kudo for being the IBMer who didn't wear the uh, blazer up here on the. Uh, <laughs> uh, very good, yes. Um, but kidding aside, there are three things that I really wanted to share that fit into this. Uh, one is that um, if you think about the way open source has evolved, um, 10 years ago, again, it was sort of mature. It's 10 years old, and now it's 20 years old. And um, does this mean that we're now at an inflection point where open source is now uh, you know, um, uh, vulnerable? The answer is yes, but it's no more vulnerable than proprietary code. Open source is not the problem. Open source is part of the solution. But studies have shown that it doesn't matter whether your code was developed in a highly distributed across the globe manner or behind the firewall you know, in a major organization. It's other things that determine how secure and co that code is. And if you looked at the average enterprise application that was developed maybe five or six years ago, it maybe had 70, 80 packages kind of under the covers. Today, that number is well over 500. So it's just the sheer knee of the curve growth in the use of open source that we're all taking advantage of that makes it this attractive attack surface. And so um, that is another reason why uh, IBM really wanted to get involved and help the overall ecosystem in the community because we've seen some examples where you know, people misunderstand what the real problem is. Andrew, uh, how about Wipro and, and you, your assessment of uh, the state? So uh, putting a few data points on a couple of um, the things that, that Rao mentioned. So in the last um, in the last couple of years, software supply chain attacks have gone up by almost 700%. Right? And Mendio just came out with a recent study that says um, they've seen a 315% increase in malicious, pa malicious packages in package manners package managers like NPM and PyPy. Uh, and that's the ones that we know of, right? Um, and so, and this is kind of a plug. Um, I came to cybersecurity late, but very active in OpenSSF. In fact, Jonathan Meadows and I of Citibank uh, founded the uh, end user working group within OpenSSF. You don't have to be an end user to participate. So we'd, we'd love participation there, but it's really, and we were just presenting on that a few minutes ago, talking about the difference between end users and vendors, and that there is a real distinction in their, in their issues. Um, one client we got engaged with um, last, a little over a year ago, they came on, they told us, they said, we think we're using about 400 different open source components, but we know it's probably higher than that. So we came on board and within a couple days, we'd identified 800, and then by the time we were done, we'd identified 8,000. And this is a large global bank with a very, very sophisticated CISO department and a very sophisticated DevOps team. Uh, and it was two orders of magnitude higher. And that's not unusual. The average, uh, the average enterprise is somewhere between 10 to 20,000 different open source components. And one uh, Sonotype did a study uh, recently uh, that, I, that said, we all know Log4j, I'm assuming, right? That's the poster child for what not to do. Uh, in open source vulnerabilities. So 29% of log4j vulnerabilities, I mean, log4j libraries downloaded today are of the unremediated versions. Today, after all the publicity around log4j, 29% if you think about that, because it's still a widely used package. So. I, I, I agree with you. I think the sheer scale of uh, where open source is produced, right? hundreds and thousands of uh, developers worldwide, different projects with different varying levels of security awareness and education and inconsistent qualities. So there's no standard in open source around security. No. And then on the consuming side, as you all said, um, there's so much consumption across the enterprise and developers across the company using it for really mission critical applications. So there's this mismatch between the quality of code that's coming out and the, the consumption of it, and then the ability to track it and deal with it from a patching perspective, and, and then the malicious nature. I, it is, there's so many moving parts uh, to this problem. Uh, what are some of the strategies and tactics that you're seeing in play? What's OpenSSF doing uh, on the producer side, on the consuming side? How? 
should we feel safer today? Uh, are, are good things happening? What do you think, Ralph? I'll start with the la uh, backwards right yeah, Should we feel safer? Uh, the sad answer is no. <laughs> Are we doing uh, good work to work towards that safety? Yes. Uh, the last uh, few years, I think OpenSSF is actually uh, driving from upfront, but it's also government involved yes. in a right way. And we're seeing a lot of work groups from NIST, CESA started, and they actually open to the public uh, to involve, comment, and learn. So there's a lot more in industry and from public and private sector trying to solve this problem. So we're not alone. So and also we're stronger together. So involving more into those will help. Uh, but at end of the day, it, to secure your form, it actually starts from you, right? I think you need to understand what are the software process in, in your form, right? Understand where the software is coming in open source, it could be the vendor software, it could be hardware coming in because pretty much all hardware has software on it. It's, a, it's considered a software these days, any hardware piece. And understanding actually, how do you monitor those ingestion points? It goes back to good old days of like automobile industry supply chain, right? You try to bring in as few quality component as possible to get work, work done from a very well-reputed suppliers. I think we have to think from software that perspective, try to minimize the components you consume and also bring in the quality components. There are a ton of tools for OpenSSF actually have scorecards. There's a star rating system, provides the hygiene of the package so that it helps you to which package is actually in a good state uh, to bring in. Um, and then, and then the traditional all security defense in depth uh, applies here to right having a good appsec process, vulnerability process, uh, security incident will help. But I think now you had to go a little further on think more about when you ingest the first package because it's going to stay with you for for a long time. Once in the form, it's very hard to take it out. A very good point. Yeah. So just to make sure that you're all on your toes and you're thinking about those questions for us in a few minutes, quick show of hands, how many recall or have heard of the book, uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair? <laughs> oh, good, more than half the group. So I bring that up because if you, you know, I like to use metaphors and history repeats itself. And if you think about the packaged foods industry in this country about a hundred years ago, you know, before that period, you know, people grew their own basically. And then with the industrial revolution, processed foods became a thing. And then when that happened, bad actors started to put sawdust in your pancake mix. And so the government had to step in and start to regulate. And now you go into any grocery store and pick up something off the shelf, you get a fairly specific and um, detailed list of the ingredients, calories, breakdown, et cetera. The same applies to what's happening in the software supply chain. And the government starting about two years ago with the executive order on cybersecurity clearly sort of put a stake in the ground to call attention to a concept that had been developing for many years prior, and it's this idea of a software bill of materials, or SBOM. And um, I'll just end, if you're curious, you can Google IBM policy SBOM, and you'll find a thought piece on the uh, website that talks about an IBM point of view on uh, the SBOM and, and what's currently important, because it is going to be a major factor. You should be thinking about it. Um, you should be getting your teams to start to get their hands dirty with it, but it's way too early to start um, passing SBOMs around like trading cards. <laughs> So I'll reflect on that a little bit. I'm a big, big fan of SBOMs. We need to do more and more and more work there. Not only in, in making <clears throat> SBOMs more, more capable, more accurate, uh, there will probably be at some point in time a uh, de facto standard. Today there are a few different ones, formats. Um, <clears throat> at some point I, I would expect the industry to kind of coalesce around, around one of them. Right now, they can almost be a little bit of a Trojan horse because there's a lot of, lot of, in, there's a, a lot of, of uh, media and 
and press, and there's a lot of outreach being done by OpenSSF and others around SBOMs. The challenge is what we're, what we're seeing in some organizations is that the engineering teams are saying, before you procure any more software, you must get an SBOM, which is great. That's a great starting point. The problem is procurement is like, okay, they ask a vendor for an SBOM, vendor provides an SBOM, and they're done, right? They don't share it, they don't create a database, they don't, uh, they don't update it, and the challenge, they don't know how to analyze it. Um, and one of the challenges is, one of the, one of the changes we've seen in enterprises over the last five years is they are becoming much more uh, open to working with smaller software startups and the technology that, that um, the, the new and emerging technology faster than they have been in the past. And one of the challenges there is you have a procurement person ask the salesperson at XYZ Startup for an S-bomb. He says, sure. He goes back and asks his team, what's an S-bomb? And they're like, uh, bill of materials of some kind. They generate it, not sure how. And then they get back to their client and they say, we've got an S-bomb. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you, there's, you don't know the validity, you don't know how updated the software is, you don't know what attestation exists. So it's really good, but there's a lot more work that we all have to do. I, I agree, and, and I feel it, it just gives you a list of ingredients, and it's not standardized, as you said, uh, but it doesn't tell you transitive dependencies, I suppose, or how it was built and how it's configured, and uh, I, I I can't imagine imagine getting a, a I don't know a thousand page S bomb list, <laughs> and saying how how do you use it how do you make use of right. it right, um, so I I love what you said, you have to catch it at the door you know when uh, before it comes in you need to know the scorecard you need to know the quality of the component coming in, then the S bomb. Uh, what else uh, is happening to make sure that the supply chain is secure? I think, did you have a question on S bombs? Or? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I saw her raise her hand. Yes. Yes. Just, so it's kind of like a chicken and an egg problem where people don't want to use S bombs because they're not totally reliable yet. I mean, they're still pretty new, but yep. we can't ever get better at creating S bombs. Yeah, that's a really good question. Absolutely. How do we keep evolving and improving and making them trustworthy? Yeah. I mean, you have to start somewhere, and the better way to start is get S bombs and also use the traditional methods, right? So the most of the Trust farms but like verify. yeah, the we have to even first even like just give us the S bomb, mm -hmm. and we do actually have tooling available to get. A, some insight into the, the, if it is open source package, we could use package analyzers to understand what the material. If it's a vendor software, a closed software, it's a little bit tricky, but still there are binary analysis tools kind of approximate what the contents are, which then you can validate, well, at least I see these four packages, it's not an S-bomb, can you verify it? So I think that will start the conversation to oh, actually they have a way to validate it, and then we're gonna get better at S-bomb. If we don't do that, I think we're never gonna really get a, a accurate way to get S-bombs, like at least near time. So I think doing a combination will help. And again, it's it's not the S-bombs, I think even the S, there's a lot of hype on S-bomb, and personally I don't believe S-bombs by itself solve anything, right? right. You, need, you need to actually understand, the good analogy I give to folks is, if you have a very small application, maybe your S bomb is like a, a box of candy. But in real life, any size, any, any enterprise application you take, you're probably not looking at actually, maybe not a bunch of boxes of chocolate, you're actually looking at a candy store. <laughs> if you look at a candy store, something like economy candy store in New York, right? Like I start being there for 20, 75 years with like hundreds and thousands of the candy and candy came from all over the world. Some are not even produced anymore. That is exactly the same way. You're gonna get S bombs of the packages which are no longer managed by anyone. They're abandoned. What are we gonna really do with it? 
So I think it's a combination of, I think, understanding that gives you actually a transparency on what is in your software. But if you need to operationalize, you need, there's a new standard co coming by VEX, Vulnerability Exploitability uh, Exchange, that gives you at least, okay, is this actually transfer dependency impacts me or not? That cut down some of it. But then you actually have to, I think, start cataloging SBOMs will give you how to prioritize when next log for shell comes up. So it's a matter of, I think, it's not directly useful now, but start collecting will help you in the long run. So it's a starting point. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the only thing I would add to it very quickly is that there's not going to be any sort of single silver bullet tool that's really going to help you you know, work your way out of this challenge. And so it kind of is really, truly kind of a, you know, don't panic now, but start your journey, get your organization on alert because it's kind of an all hands on deck moment, especially if you're an enterprise software provider. If you're on the receiving end, you still need to start to scale up, but it's a bit different. Yeah, and, and something um, you mentioned, Nithya, I, I think operating, moving to a zero trust architecture is probably the, the best approach at this time, right? What is zero trust architecture? So it, it's where you look at your entire IT system. We're probably familiar with dual factor authentication, mm -hmm. which is one of the, the elements of a zero trust architecture, right? It's looking at your entire architecture, your entire supply chain, and essentially applying zero trust towards it, right? So you're, you're, there has to be verification at every step. In, in your or at every process, every action that occurs within your architecture. You start with not trusting anything. Right. And then it, building. It's, I don't even like saying that, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, from a practical perspective, that's one of the design principles we need to be thinking about today. And to what you said about VEX, what I like about VEX is the fact that it actually forces the supplier mm -hmm. to, they, they can't, if they're subscribing to VEX, they can't just provide a list of components to you. They actually, have, they have actually had to go into their own bill of materials and they have to understand how they interact. Mm -hmm. Because you can provide a list of components and they may have vulnerabilities, but if they're reviewed in context of how they're actually interacting, how they're layered, how they integrate, then that provides a lot more, a much richer set of information to the, to the person who's consuming it. That's exactly right, and that's, that's how I feel. It's a starting point, just like food labels started with perhaps just a list of ingredients, and now they're so rich with information that one can actually walk away and say, do I want to consume this or not? What's the impact to me? Um, it's, it's, it's a good starting point, and we need to see how it plays out. Uh, and we are open for questions now. Um, Guy. where a customer of a company that I shall not name uh, came and said, um, give us your S-bomb. And uh, the engineering team went, huh? Right? We've all been familiar with this story. Where from the business side does this get driven? Right? Because what ended up happening in that particular case is the salesperson said, oh, 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 customer needs an S-bomb. So, of course, we dutifully produce the list, and then the engineering team forgets about it, and then the next customer comes and says, we need an S-bomb. They're like, oh, yeah, we did that thing way back when there's no what's what drives the institutional desire need to do this wanting to stay out of jail yes oh, yeah <laughs> and, yeah, well, and, yeah exactly Takes, and, and there's a forcing function too with the directive i believe yeah. right. as of a certain date companies need to be able to have the muscles and the capacity to produce an s-bomb uh, that's demanded uh, within a certain amount of time. Oh, absolutely. And but so uh, in, in cases that I've seen, like uh, at Amazon, um, the tooling team that's responsible for the uh, development pipeline is building that capability in so that any team that uses that service to release their products gets that as, as a as a benefit or as a service. Humor aside though, it's a carrot and stick proposition because Uncle Sam is saying, hey, if you want to continue, if you're an enterprise software company today and you want to 
continue to sell your products and have us purchase them, we are eventually going to be requiring an S-bomb. So start developing your capabilities now. So there's the carrot, and then the stick is going to be around future legislation that when I think government officials believe that there's been enough time that that muscle or capability has started to become more common in the industry, it'll start to become more of a stick proposition if you're not ahead of the curve. Yeah. I consider it's more of a paid forward, actually, also, right? If, um, if a software producer is actually need to produce a bomb, to get a good actual S bomb, you need to ask your dependents, dependents to even get the S bomb. And it's a cycle of, right? I think then you realize actually it's my responsibility to give the S bombs to my consumers. So I think it, in my case, it's actually, I think we all need to think from it. So part of our responsibility is providing S bombs to our customers. Just like we do with attribution notices when we distribute software, right? I, I think um, yeah, we've been you, you okay. Sorry, I, I don't know who was first. Sorry, David. Thank you. Excellent panel, really appreciate the insights, but you just brought up the attribution document, Nithya. So that was actually what my question was. Are you working directly with your OSPOs to layer into your SBOMs the attribution information such as licensing and copyright statements because those are not part of the NTIA minimum elements? And I'm curious, or are those disjointed functions in your companies? I love your question. Today, I think in most companies, it's probably disjointed. Uh, and SBOMs don't have nearly enough richness and detail that needs to go into attributions. Uh, but I think we should be cooperating and working together to uh, get both functions fulfilled, distribution, attribution, as well as you know, SBOM. SBOM really should get to that kind of richness, to be honest with you, um, you know, with regards to license information and release and, you know, all of that good stuff. But I would also say that, yes, you know, this is a chance for an OSPO to further demonstrate yes. leadership within the organization because when you start to wrap your head around this challenge, you start to realize, wow, there's a lot of additional yes. information that I and or my management team might benefit from yes. that uh, is sort of becomes a large, you know, list of hashtag, you know, what do you really want to capture? And then what subset of that are you going to be um, directed to or encouraged to share? And those two lists could be very different. Yeah. And the fact that those lists could be different is a scary thing because then you're producing two documents that don't agree from the same company. Yes. Right. I would I would add that. I, th I was talking to someone from SPDX group last night. The 3.0 version they're going to release actually have concept of profiles. There's a dedicated profile for licensing elements along with security profile. There's also AI model profile. So I think they actually the newer version of SPDX may actually have one document, have everything. This but we're the not there is. yet. But we should get, get to one doc, yes. Yes. So I'd like to explore the idea of the carrots versus the sticks. Um, you know, I, I definitely, it rings very true. We may, as a company that consumes software from third-party vendors, we may ask for SBOMs, but we don't necessarily have something to do with them yet. Yes. Um, so there's definitely a mismatch there between the type of information you can, you can request and what you can do with that and then how you act on that later. Um, kind of just setting up the question here, one of the things that we do when we work with a third party under you know, many circumstances, we want to see evidence that they can produce an SBOM. We, I, I'm working on revising our procurement template to require this from companies who we buy software from. Uh, the idea being that we're not going to be able to use it now, but at some point in the future, we'll be able to, and to the point that, you know, once it comes in the door, it sticks around for a while, contracts are usually durable for quite some period of time. So you may find a situation where you want to go back and, you know, it, you may not have the tool today, you may have the tool in the future, but you may need to lean on some language that says this vendor will produce this for us when, when we ask. Getting to my question, I, I'm curious what ideas you have for other carrots that we can put in place that will benefit us down the road? Like, what can we be seeding today for when everything catches up and we are actually able to act on these? 
Are you talking I'm, about what vendors should supply you along with the SBOM, kind of a reader or other types of tools? It, yeah, so, yes. Yeah. So maybe not necessarily you know, vendors and, and, and tools and readers and things like that, but it's more what behaviors should we be encouraging in our suppliers mm -hmm. that down the road mm -hmm. we'll look back on and say, dang, that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think, real quick, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, one of the, I think, benefits is that we all collectively need to find a way to make better software, to try and have grace with the developers that are toiling on this, uh, and also at the same time find a way to realize that if we can start to improve that holistically across the industry by sharing information and cooperating like people do through open source, that a rising tide can float all boats. And by putting that rigor against your suppliers, you're actually making them up their game. And it's going to improve the chance that they're going to be a long-term supplier to you as well as a more successful and hopefully profitable going concern. And <clears throat> I'd echo what uh, Jeffrey said. And I think it, it's important for us to recognize that we're in a period of education. And we have to educate ourselves. We have to get engaged. We have to contribute. We have to make these tools better. But large end consumers or end users also have to be willing to educate their suppliers. Because you're going to be working with a lot of suppliers, and some of them are going to be quite knowledgeable and actually give you an SBOM with updated information. But you have to help others understand that if they're giving you a piece of software that has Log4j in it, there, there are tools coming down the road that will automatically notify you as to which version, if it's an unre unremediated version. But right now, you have to help educate your suppliers and why it's important for them to provide that inf information to you. So I think we're, we're all in this stage of education. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I would go further and say, you know, expect your suppliers to be actively involved in upstream communities and in making sure we are lifting um, the quality of upstream uh, through you know, opportunities like the Alpha Omega project or scorecards or other things. Uh, I think we all need to um, be holding each other accountable and uh, raising the, the bar for all of us. I think there's, there's one question at the back and then we'll come back here. Thank you. Um, I would agree that I think OSPOs are a great way to um, have a, a structured program office that works with procurement, security, um, and other uh, groups across the organization to get SBOMs. But have you seen any inner source initiatives or inner source program offices um, that are happening now as a pathway to open source security? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, actually JPMC has a very strong inner source community. And one of the things actually we've been trying out is start producing SBOMs for our software we create, right? And that's where we could start uh, generating, validating, also look into oper operational before we start consuming other SBOMs. So, so treating so each other as customers, customers. inside and the company. That would help, I think, uh, in the down the road, like open up that to the open source packages too. So in a way, you are starting program early. Um, I'll quickly add to uh, to the previous question. I mean, it's not just about carrot or stick in my opinion. It's more about when we had log for shell attack, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of us actually end up calling vendors saying, are you actually impacted? <laughs> Tell us. And they don't actually have answer directly, right? They say, yeah, we'll get back to you. And then we were panic, like, should we block them or are we need to be worried? And we wait for the patches and it's a long process. And imagine, I think, yeah, it's a little bit long of in the initially extra work to produce. It makes a lot easier for them to like within first day, simply say, we're not impacted. This is S bomb, good on. And even we can validate, we don't need to even go to them. We can see what are all the vendors with S bombs where this package is there right away. And we feel good about it. They feel good, at, and the relationship gets stronger and stronger. Trust. So I think it's a, it's a win-win for both, in my opinion, rather than because government asks you to do it, do it. That's a stick approach. But in my opinion, it's a more of a win-win situation. 
And to your point on intersource, uh, uh, yes, I think some of that's though driven by the size of the organization you're supporting. Um, but uh, you know, uh, in parallel, uh, IBM is having its Think Week, and uh, there's been a lot of announcements about a um, IBM's uh, next generation approach to AI and Watson X, and that's a direct uh, derivative of an intersource initiative that we kicked off several years ago. So it's another way, I think it's hard for smaller entities to both have an effective uh, open source OSPO and try and do intersource at the same time. But at a certain critical size, uh, it's definitely a benefit. I know we are over time, but uh, we have one more question. Okay, um, so a lot of uh, open source security work is about preventative measures to prevent these supply chain attacks from happening. Um, and my question is around how do you, I mean, I work at an open source technology center and like it's, we find it difficult to incentivize risk management when there's competing priorities with features and like things that, and a lot of what you're doing is like, we want to do this so we don't get sued like in compliance cases yes. or like to, um, um, you know, work with the federal government. Like how do you incentivize risk management and open source security when it may be, like it's not actively producing revenue. Why do we have to do that? It hasn't broken yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say, you know, uh, automation, uh, building it into um, the pipeline. But even making, building that is like, takes cycles and like That's right, it teams, does take so. cycles and it's making it dead easy. Uh, and And, you know, with guardrails built in, that sort of thing. Because uh, human nature, you're ex absolutely right, is that um, you know feature priorities and customer issues take over, and you cannot do the, the the good things that you do need to do from a security and compliance perspective. So that's that's what that's the approach we're taking is uh, just just build it in and make it easy for them to do the right thing. Eat your vegetables. <laughs> eat your vegetables. You know, my mother used to do that. Uh, I did not eat vegetables as a child. And she used to just blend it in, you know, with uh, sambar or rice or whatever. And, and I could not pick it apart, so I would eat it. I, I learn something new every day. <laughs> yes. I think but, considering um, also it's not just a security problem, it's more of a hygiene problem. Yes. And the easy example, right, you wait a year and now all of a sudden, you have to upgrade from 1.2 to 2.8 or 3.1, for God's sake. Then it's, it's a lot of work. You don't know what changed. It's a lot of work on the team and also in a panic moment. You have to do it. Security is on your throat to do it. Versus if you start doing every beginning of the sprint, I'll just update to whatever is the latest minor version. You're ready. You just need to go to the next version when it is ready. So I think making that as a part of your hygiene is the only way we can scale. One, one last comment though, if you're not in the security office, go to the security office and ask them how they address it. Because one of the biggest challenges for CISO teams is th the comment that, hey, we did everything right and we still were hacked, right? And that's, that's the question that whenever CISO teams go for budget, that they face that. You know, we'll do everything right, we'll still get hacked. We'll just wait until we're hacked and then we'll remediate it, right? No, we don't have to put out all that upfront investment. So they've got some great answers to that. So if you're not part of the CISO, the security team, go to them because they can actually help position this. By the way, open source program officers can learn a lot from the security yes. teams because they're very, very good at getting attention and getting investment as rightly they should. And we should be partnering more and more with them uh, in, in terms of, you know, making sure that the right things are getting invested in. Yeah, so a, a, amen to that because the, having tried to use the carrot to motivate transformation within IBM for several years and then moving into the CISO organization and suddenly it's like, well, gee, you know, we can issue this edict and you comply or you don't ship your product. <clears throat> it yeah. focuses the mind. Yeah. So thank you so much for, thank you to my panel. And thank you to all of you for all the brilliant questions asked. It, it is a moving target. And uh, we all need to get involved is what I'm hearing. And that we should use good old fashioned supply chain, you know, discipline and hygiene 
uh, inspect it from the beginning and make sure that we know where we are using it so that we can respond fast. And don't look at SBOM as just the government telling us, but as a starting point for really discovery, building trust, et cetera. So thank you, everyone. And thank shameless you, plug, tomorrow, or tomorrow at 2 o'clock, another session <clears throat> on navigating open source and open standards to try and find the right balance for your OSPO, if you're interested. Awesome. Thank you, Nitya, for thank you. excellent marks. Thank you.